Hello and welcome to Film in Focus here on Beyond Radio. I'm your host, the Cinema Professor. And thanks for listening and Ray Turner's back and that's because it's the final countdown of the comedy lists and Ray's going to join me for a head-off on our top 20s, individual top 20, so this could be quite interesting. Um, Thanks for coming, Ray. Thank you. How's it going? Good. So, without further ado, Ray, you start us off. Let's have your number 20. My number 20 comedy film. Um, yes. I think this mic is not working. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. Okay, my top 20 comedy film is um, a very old film from 1907. Okay. It's a, a George Melier film. And Excellent. It's called The Eclipse. Um... The Eclipse. We're having a bit of technical trouble. Technical, yeah. Um, okay, go on. It's called The Eclipse, and um, it is uh, a short film. It's only nine minutes long. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's fair to say, a complete barrel of laughs, but it just has a moment halfway through the film when um, when um, the actual eclipse occurs. Perhaps you should do your 20 and I'll come back okay. to me in a minute. Okay, well, I've not seen that one, so I'll make a note of that one. That's the Eclipse from George Melanet, who I'll be mentioning next week for a different film. Um, And so my number 20, (laughs) a more current film, is Meet the Parents, which I do consider to be a bit of a modern classic. It's, of course, um, Ben Stell recently engaged... Is t- goes along with his girlfriend to meet his, um, her family for the first time. And, of course, it's this very relatable modern comedy um, about um, trying to measure up for what the father, played by Robert De Niro, expects and all the sort of tensions of that. And, of course, you get the jokes about him being a sort of a male nurse and his, uh, and his name and what have you. And um, a lot of the laughs come from the interactions with him and the father, played by De Niro. And, of course, it was a big film with De Niro um, changing to comedy and they... Brintley used his kind of machismo from his gangster-type roles for comic effect. And I remember the poster is the De Niro putting him on the lie detector, which is a great scene. And it's a very relatable comedy and lots of good interactions and some more visual gags as well, like the sort of volleyball (laughs) gag in the swimming pool I really like, but... A good cast, Owen Wilson in quite an early role as well as this sort of quite... quite he sounds insufferable, isn't he? Yeah, quite sleazy sort of, um, like, Heber- uh, or bohemian-type character. But always going on about Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I, I do really enjoy Meet the Parents, so that's my number 20. Um, Ray, you can either go to 19 well, or... Shall I, yeah, I mean, I just would very quickly say about uh, the, the Eclipse. It's not a very funny film, but about halfway through... There is the eclipse moment as nine minute film, and um, it is. It's it's just you've got to watch it. It's on YouTube. Just Google it and watch it. It's, okay. It's just not what you expect, and it's just hysterically funny. And the first time I saw it, I cried with laughter for about twenty minutes <laughs> after the film had actually finished. I was still laughing. So it's a film with one laugh, but. It's a hell of a laugh. It's a great laugh. It went on for a long time. And okay. <laughs> so, uh, number 19, I've gone for a Preston Sturgis film. I haven't got the dates. I didn't write down the dates. Um, but it's called Christmas in July, and it's a Dick Powell and okay. Ellen Drew movie. And it's just about a guy who, um, who dreams of coming up with the perfect um, advertising slogan for a coffee. And um, he comes up with, if you can't sleep, it's not the coffee, it's the bunk. And nobody quite gets it. And... Um, and anyway, his friends think it's a terrible slogan and they convince him that he's won. And so he, he starts spending all his money that he's won. Okay. Um, and, and of course, he doesn't actually have it. Um, and that's really the comedy. There is a very short film. It's like just over an hour long. OK. It's very funny. What's the name again? Christmas in July. Christmas in July. Preston Great Sturgis. stuff. OK, so my number 19 is Sideways, the Alexandra Payne film... Um, so this is about two college best friends. One of them's getting married, so it's their last weekend of freedom, and he essentially wants a good 
sort of time pursuing women um, and getting drunk, whereas the other guy's really a wine aficionado. He wants to relax and drink some wine, play some golf. So they're complete opposites. Um, and it's this really hilarious but also subtle sort of observational sort of comedy with a nice sort of pacing and some really fun relatable sort of um slices of life almost some really crude or cringeworthy sort of humor as well but again which feels very true to life and there's a really beautiful scene with the virginia manderson character with and the paul giamatti character really good ensemble work in this film um where they're just talking about what it is about their favorite wines which which sort of attracts them to that and the way she describes it it's just such a romantic scene which you wouldn't expect and of course their relationship is kind of the heart of the film but it's a film i return to a lot great writing and that is sideways from 2004. So let's have your number 18. Number 18. My number 18 is a Mel Brooks film, and uh, it's probably not the one you expect. It's High Anxiety. Okay. Um, which is a parody of Hitchcock, um, and kind of brilliant. And it, I mean, um, just for me, it was much funny. I don't know if it's because it's kind of about films, obviously, that I know a little bit. And mm. stuff, but I mean, I mean, some of the bits that I remember, they do a kind of um, Mickey Take of the Birds. And yeah. Mel Brooks is walking through a park and all these birds start gathering. And, and of course, they all start flying around and they start pooing on him. <laughs> and it's just him running away from, like, <laughs> bomb, bomb, being bombarded with bird poo. That's great. And they do this kind of shower, the psycho shower scene. Um, I won't tell you how they do that. And uh, <laughs> just a lot of, a lot of, kind of, uh, a lot of um, things about vertigo and things like that. He's a, he's a psychiatrist who suffers from high anxiety, which is basically vertigo. Yes. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's just, uh, okay. I, think, I think it's his best, it's pro- his best film. Um, yeah. Possibly the exception of the producers, but I mm. actually put it on the list rather than the producers, actually. Okay, good choice. Um, so my number 18, which again is nostalgia-based, but one I always enjoy re-watching, The Princess Bride from 1980. Um, delightful film, delightful sort of parody on storytelling and fairy tales and... Um, an all-star kind of cast. Then when you Peter say. Funk as yeah, the the grandfather is just delightful. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a Rob Reiner film as well. You know, he really seems to nail the these sorts of films. And yeah, I, I've talked quite a lot about it on the show before, so I don't need to say much. But yeah, it's always a charming film, very well cast. So. <laughs> the Princess Bride is my number eighteen. What's your seventeen? My number seventeen. Um, Galaxy Quest, which is okay. um, which is a you know a comedy sci-fi, um, and the premise of it is that you have a kind of a bunch of actors who are in a kind of show which is obviously meant to be Star Trek. Yes. Um, and some aliens who are being attacked by a sort of an intergalactic evil guy um, see this show and think we need to recruit these guys to help us fight to fight the real aliens. So the the kind of the the kind of Comedy, a lot of the comedy comes from the fact that there's a bunch of actors who <laughs> act like actors um, having to fight an intergalactic war. Um, yeah. And there's just some great, great sort of characters in it. Um, I mean, Alan Rickman, I think, really stands out. As mm. the kind of, he's kind of obviously that sort of Leonard Nimoy, Spock kind of character who's yeah. kind of t- always talking about how he's a serious actor, but the only part yeah. anybody cares about is this alien that he played. And, <laughs> um, but, but Tony Shalhoub is uh, amazing as well as the kind mm. of um, he's just he's just completely unfazed by everything they throw at him. They kind of send him through kind of uh, teleport systems and land him on other planets. And he meets aliens and he just completely takes it in his stride. Like, it's just an everyday event for him. Um, yeah, and I mean just uh, and 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 Sigourney Weaver's in it. Tim Allen is in it. Um, yeah, and just just a really great cast, really funny film. Um, That's and, great. And lovely sci-fi movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very good. It didn't quite make my list, but it's one I enjoy a lot. Very, very sharp. Um, and my number, yeah, 17, yeah, sorry, <laughs> is A Fish Called Wonder from 1988. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's one I remember from a long time ago, which I revisited recently. You've got some great 
Python S action with Cleese and um, Palin playing off each other. Um, Kevin Klein perhaps has never been better. Um, such a charismatic performance from him. I think he won an Oscar for it actually. Did but he? yeah, he is very good in it. So very black <laughs> sort of high sniffing his arm movie. So he's Indeed. About to make love, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, it, it, it's another film I've spoken quite a lot about. But it's yeah, it's always entertaining. A lot of good slapstick moments. So a fish called Wonder is my seventeen. What's your sixteen? My sixteen. Well, my sixteen is a bit. Um, I think it's a comedy. It's it's a, a Louis Bunuel movie. It's a it's quite surreal and it's Phantom of Liberty. Okay. Um, I think he is playing it for laughs though. It's it's it's. I think it sort of probably was a big influence on Monty Python. Um, Although I think it came after, I don't know, actually, I don't know when the dates were. But it's got that kind of feel about it. And, I mean, it's, it's probably the most famous scene in it. Um, it's a little bit disgusting. Okay. But I hope nobody's eating. But um, people go to a sort of dinner party and um, instead of... It's, and I think he's kind of trying to send up sort of this kind of middle class kind of, you know, polite society. And so they all go to a dinner party. There's a big table. And around the table, there's all these toilets and people are just sitting on the toilet, sort of happily defecating and <laughs> chatting. And then one of them gets up and he goes, I've, I've just got to excuse myself. And he goes into a little room and starts eating some food. <laughs> and then somebody knocks on the door and says, can, can, are you going to be long? We, we want to come in and we're hungry. And so they kind of just turn that on its head. And it's just, um, I mean, that's the most famous bit, I think. Uh, I mean, the, the yeah. other bit that kind of really made me laugh as a police inspector. Who, who's got all these cadets and and, they, and they're just like school children. And every time he turns his back, they sort of throw bits of paper at him. And things. <laughs> so it's, it's quite. It's, it's, you know, does, yeah, it's a I've strange thing. That. Obviously, that it's a very odd great. film. It's, um, um, yeah. Cool. Okay, my my number sixteen is another one everyone knows: Groundhog Day from nineteen ninety three, oh. a Bill Murray classic. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it really balances a charming romantic comedy, obviously, with a lot of dark humour and sort of themes about mortality and human life and existence. And Bill Murray at his very best um, mm. really perfects that deadpan sort of persona, really well cast as a grumpy TV weatherman, and it holds up on, on repeat viewing, so... yeah. A classic film, I think, from the early the 90s. Kind of, it, yeah. I mean, Andy McDowell's not great in anything, really, but she's nah. actually quite good in that, isn't she? I think. Yeah, you sort of... I think you can see her appeal to him sort of thing and yeah. the way she want, she makes him want to be a better person, essentially, yeah. <laughs> which is a big part of the film. Yeah, she's actually not too bad in that. Yeah. <laughs> So that's Groundhog Day. What's your next pick, 15? So number 15. I think you've done this one, actually. It's Team America. Um, well, please. I think you had that in yes. your, uh, further down in your list. It America. was further down. But, I mean, for me, it's just got some amazingly funny moments. I mean, obviously, the kind of, you know, the whole... I mean, the very obvious scenes of the, the puppet being sick and the puppets having sex. Um, but, actually, there's just a moment in it. I can't remember if I mentioned this when you did it, but that just made me cry with laughter. That, and they send this actor on, on his mission and the guy says, it's nothing to do with puppets. I mean, and the guy says, this is um, a dangerous mission. And if you're captured, you may want to take your own life. So I'm giving you this. And he gives him a hammer. And uh -huh. it just made me howl with laughter. It's kind of <laughs> just so, but what really occurred to me is that, is that when it was made, I think it was kind of, it may have been Obama, but it was kind of sending up kind of Bush view of America being yes. the world police. And it doesn't entirely seem like a parody anymore now that we've got... No. I mean, you know, Bush was bad, but, you know, now we've got Trump, it it kind of feels a bit real. Yeah. So especially he's like, meeting Kim Jong-un. <laughs> um, yeah, it's you know, insane to think well, that was a parody back then, yeah. you know, quite a while ago um, now, and it's still <laughs> so relevant and even more relevant now. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, <laughs> and apparently they wanted to make, they wanted to remake Armageddon, with the action, they didn't want to change the script. They wanted to remake Armageddon with puppets, <laughs> but they weren't allowed, so they made this instead. They made it, so, okay. Um, so I mean, they, they, they're kind of you know that kind of um, what's his name? Uh, uh, who's the director of Armageddon? Oh, Michael Bay. Michael Bay. Yeah, yeah that, that that kind of they wanted to send up that kind of thing as well. Yeah. 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 Great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
So my number 15, and an older pick from me this time, it's The Gold Rush, the Charlie Chaplin film oh, right. from 1925. So this is... Yeah, kind of the tramp character and this really unique mix of comedy and tragedy, really. It's based on images of the Klondike gold rush and also apparently on the Donner Party. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the snowboarding um, when they were snowbound in Nevada and resorted to cannibalism. Camel, so yeah. it really shows this darker that humor. Scene where, element. where he turns into yeah. a chicken, isn't there? And the guy's yeah. chasing him around and you know, trying to shoot him and stuff. Yeah, I remember I actually saw, <laughs> saw a screening of this for a class at, at college and really just, yeah, so rich visually and so dynamic and obviously, yeah, you really get these energetic but really beautifully staged scenes, mm. well, great, great slapstick in, um, interactions. There may so. be more Chaplin coming up. Yeah, which is always good. So <laughs> Always good. It's a fantastic film, yes, that's The Gold Rush. And what's your number 14? My number 14, I think you've got this one on your list, actually, is uh, Love and Death, which is a Woody Allen okay. movie. Um, and again, possibly not the one that people kind of think of when they think of Woody Allen. They think of Annie Hall, obviously. And um, Yes. I don't know, maybe Manhattan and Paris, Midnight in Paris. But um, mm. But this is just kind of... This is a sort of moment, I think, when he was starting to become a bit more serious as a filmmaker. He was... He'd he, he'd been making sort of films like you know Take the Money and Run and Bananas, and, yeah. and Sleeper, and here he was kind of doing a film which, which was visually very beautiful, um, but he was still kind of going for that kind of slightly broad comedy, and he just pulls it off beautifully in this film, and uh, it's just got so many fantastic bits. I mean, these are, it's all set during the Napoleonic Wars or the lead up to the Napoleonic mm. Wars. I don't know how much you want me to say because I think have you got this one. I think you may it may well be coming up. It may yes. well be coming up again. Um, <laughs> well, I'll talk about it a little bit, I'll, and then uh, then you can say your thing about say it. Say so, my thing. Yeah. But um, I mean, there's 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 nods to um, Battleship Temkin uh, in the film. Um, yeah. Um, and he kind of turns the idea of the lions. Kind of, I don't know if anybody knows Battleship Temkin, but the, the kind of the three shots of lions, kind of sleeping, sitting up, and standing, and he, you know, to to rise up, so that the people rising up, and he uses it. The opposite way round of the lion standing, sitting, and sleeping, and it's kind of him, yes, um, becoming tired <laughs> after <laughs> making love to a to a, to a woman. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've just got some amazing bits where the peasants are kind of sort of talking. And they've got this kind of high fluting sort of uh, very articulate. They talk about things being jejun and things like that. <laughs> yeah, I love that bit. Yeah, um, yeah, and there's just a fantastic. I think there's a duel scene, which is absolutely amazing. I won't tell you how, how that goes. And, yeah. But there's another bit where, I mean, where there's, Napoleon has a double and they're, and they're, and they're kind of talking about, um, you know, the, Napoleon says, you're, you're going to be my double, I shall teach you to walk like me. <laughs> and so you see these two guys who, who are played by the same actor um, walk off into the background and they're kind of out of focus. It's the guy of Back to the Future, isn't it? It is the teacher, who plays Mr. Strick. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. I, you know, that had not occurred to me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but the, but so you, the, it stays on the foreground. The two guys are talking in the foreground, and in the background you see these two Napoleons kind of, wondering, and then they start fighting. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. and it's kind of you can't really see it. It's kind of out of focus and, and blurry. That and detail, it. yeah, yeah. But you can so just see funny. that they're just fighting. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know why. Anyway, Excellent. what's your fourteen? Okay, my fourteen is His Girl Friday. Oh. So, yes, Howard Hawke's film, a satire on um, set around newspaper. Oh, well. Yes. See, this happened. This, Me too. I, I thought this would happen at yeah. one point. From 1939, classic screwball farce. So, Cary Grant plays a newspaper editor, Walter Burns, and he's about to lose his new, newly engaged ex wife, who's an ace reporter, played by Rosaline Russell. Russell. <laughs> and so it's a last grass attempt to sort of hold on to her, essentially. So they agree to investigate a murder plot. And, yeah, of course, they have wonderful chemistry and you get some of the sharpest dialogues you ever see yeah. brilliantly delivered. So that's my 14. And if you want to say a few words on it. Um, yeah, well, uh, well, um, well cause it's, it's on my list too. So mm. I will wait till I get there. OK. Okay, so um, what... It's coming up quite soon, actually. Quite soon, okay. <laughs> um, so we'll... So my number 13, is, are we, have you finished on 14? We might... 
Oh, no, no, no. Do you want to go to music? Uh, no, my number um, 13, okay, we'll no. do this. Okay. Um, <laughs> is, is, a, is a Fellini movie. Um, and again, it's a little bit surreal, but it's, it's uh, Amacord. Okay. Um, which yeah. is a, a kind of coming of age movie, but it's, it's, so it follows this boy, Tito, and it's just basically a year in his life. Um, and it's, I couldn't, it's not really a plot. I mean, it is just a sort of, you know, it starts kind of in the, in the autumn and goes through. And it's really about him kind of having a kind of, you know, awakening of sort of his sort of sexual awakening and fantasies and, mm. and I don't know how much to say about it. There is a very famous, um, well, I don't know if it's very famous, but there's a very funny scene where some boys are in a car pleasuring themselves and uh, <laughs> they're all about sex aren't they <laughs> they really are um and um, and i have to keep finding new euphemisms um and um and whilst fantasizing okay. about uh, all the women in the village um and that's that is in itself very funny but then it cuts to the outside of the car and the headlights on the car are flashing as in time to their kind of movements and it's kind of a visual gag but it's very funny. yeah it's a great film, and it's one which was borderline for me just because you're never quite sure if it classes as a comedy. No, like, you it, were yeah. a bit unsure. I, but... Well, I was very unsure, you know, but I kind of thought, well, I'm, I'm going to just take films. Yeah. Because there's films in here that are technically comedies. Yeah. Like... Yeah, don't name them. Well, I mean, that I've not put on my list, away. actually, which oh, I actually okay. think are <laughs> sometimes better films than some of the ones I have made my list. Yeah. But they're not as funny, if you know what I mean. Doctor yeah. Strange Love is really the kind of thing I'm thinking of. It's just a brilliant film. Okay. And it is funny, but it hasn't it's not as funny as some of these other films, but it's actually a better film in my opinion. So, so yeah. And I think I think Amacord is funny though. I mean Amacord yeah. is very funny. I agree. Yeah. So Amacord <laughs> is your number thirteen. So I had a couple of correspondence, one without a name, just asking basically if if most films from the sign era are comedies, and I think we all agree not really. No. I think there was a range of genres. Yeah, there were no different from that they even, era. They even kind of did musicals actually. I mean weirdly. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, they so did pretty much everything. Certainly a range, yeah, from that from that era. People of remember film. the comedies. Yeah. And a regular, as always, Ellie Dudley, getting in touch. Thank you, Ellie, once again. Hi, Cinema Pro. <laughs> Please, can you say a great, big, massive happy birthday to your biggest fan and favourite listener, Johnny Rhodes. He can't tune in tonight as he is out celebrating his 27th birthday. I'm recording the show for him tonight to listen. Great stuff, Ellie. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to Johnny. Johnny. And thanks for being regular listeners. So Ray did his number 13 before the break, and I'll do mine now, and it's Annie Hall, one of the oh. big hitters from Woody Allen, and, of course, one that really made a big name of Diane Keaton, uh, obviously title character, is is fantastic in it. And quite as subversive, it's when he's starting to play more with structure and plot. You get, obviously, the famous scene with Marshall McLuhan outside the cinema, which is is a great scene. So that's a good example of him playing a bit more with form. So that's my number 13. What's your number 13? No, my number 12. That Sorry, was... number 12. I know, my number 12 is, is Girl Friday. Um, <laughs> is Girl Friday, which, is, which, is which delightful, I had recently. It? Yeah. Yes. So, um, so we, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> OK, great <laughs> well, stuff. we can if you want, right? Um, no, 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 I think we can move on. Cool. My number 12, which I saw a screening of this week, is The Big Lebowski, one of my favourite Coen Brothers film. It is a cult classic. And, yeah, if you can see it on the big screen, do that. It's the most surreal, unique um, stoner comedy you'll ever see. <laughs> it's that, but so much more. Of course, you get philosophy with it being a Coen Brothers film. You get bowling, you get really weird, strange characters. And it's one of those, it shouldn't work. When you lay out the plot, it should be a shambles, but somehow it just works. There's just something about them. I think that's what they do best, best, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, when, they, when they take a shambles and kind of turn it into a plot. I think, yeah. I think all too often they take a shambles and don't turn it into a plot, and that's the problem. Yeah. Um, but when they do, I think it's fantastic. But when they're on form, yeah, they're really yeah. a unique, um, distinct pair. It's a great visual film, great music, it and could, it could, it could the have, cast is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, John Turturro 
sort of is in it yeah. criminally little um and steals the film i think doesn't he um a little bit i mean he's in it for about two minutes and yeah should, and apparently he should have his own movie improvised his role as oh, really? well I but, know that. Oh, really. but i do like the way they set that shot when he's introduced of them just <laughs> watching him and it's a tracking shot sort of thing and it's yeah. just yeah their, their mouths are on the floor sort of thing <laughs> of this really eccentric sort of dirty sort of character but yeah tremendous film i highly recommend it if you haven't seen it so i think it's your number 11 my number 11 is a uh, pillow talk okay just mainly because i just think you've got to have doris day in a in a comedy in, in any kind of any kind of film list it's somewhere doris day has to be in it um but it is a very funny film um and it's not a film it's uh, that, that could be made now because it's all about people with party lines so you know, it's been dated for a long time, but it, the, the premise is so simple. It's, uh, Doris Day is kind of prim, proper interior decorator. Rock Hudson is a, a womanising songwriter who hogs the party line and she can't get any work done. Um, and they hate each other over the phone, but of course they meet in real life and fall in love. And it's just the perfect romantic comedy, really. Um, and Doris Day is just... You know, like a goddess, isn't yeah. she? <laughs> and um, I think I go giggly. I go, <laughs> um, but also, you know, just you need Doris Day somewhere. Okay, in your list. That's fair enough. You've made a good argument. <laughs> so my number eleven from nineteen forty. It is the Philadelphia Story. So it's this societal comic farce with almost the golden trio of that era: Cary Grant, Kathleen Hepburn. James Stewart, um, it's lavishly shot by George Kakar and this great um, comedy of misunderstandings and, again, a lot of wit sort of thrown in there to do with um, higher society. Of course, it is uh, based on a Broadway play, Broadway musical, I should say. And, yeah, it's tremendous fun and you've got those those that, that sort of trio on top of their games, really, Um yeah, so that's the Philadelphia story, my number 11. So we're into the top, top 10. 10. Top 10. Like top of the pops. <laughs> yeah. So at number 10, um, <laughs> I've gone for Playtime, which I think you did last week. Yes. Um, so obviously it's quite interesting, isn't it? The same films keep coming up, and I guess yes. it, it kind of proves, you know, in a sense. Um, but it, it's a Jacques Tati movie. Um, I, I mean, it, you laugh so much in the first half hour that you actually can't laugh anymore by the end of the film, mm. I think. And and that's its sort of failing, actually. That's why it didn't go higher on my list. Yeah. Because it's so inventive. It's so phenomenally inventive. Um, but you're just exhausted by the end of it. I mean, you just... you, you, yeah. you I, I think it would be great as, like... I don't know how long it is, but kind of broken up into little half-hour chunks and you watch it yeah. like as, a, as a series. Because there's no story to speak of. It's just stuff. That's yeah, really, um, but it's it's just staggeringly inventive. Um, that's really the thing. <laughs> inventive is the word of the day here. Indeed. Okay, good choice. So that's your number ten, and my number ten is bringing up Baby from nineteen thirty eight. Howard Hawks, um, once again, and this is really an oddity because, of course, as some of you will know, the baby of the title is, of course, a leopard, a giant leopard. Um, that further adds complications to Cary Grant's David Huxley's life. And it's just so much fun watching the leopard and Catherine Hepburn's Susan slowly wear him down and <laughs> essentially beat him into submission. It's a, it's a pure joy. And it's just so bizarre for a comedy of that time period, for a romantic comedy. And it just has this magical sort of imagery and surreal feel to it, which I like to see. Him. It's a different way to do that sort of romantic comedy. Yeah. And, yeah, Hepburn is just dynamite you know Carrie just Grant's so just funny amazing isn't he he's a great foil isn't he and it's kind of nice to see him play a slightly different sort of role than yeah. a lot of his previous or future roles so that's bringing up baby which i think is a classic so what's your number My nine number nine planes trains and automobiles okay which is john hughes who i'm not a huge fan of really i'm not a huge fan of his kind of teenage comedy films but this one i think it, it was kind of after that and then he sort of, he, I don't know, he was doing Home Alone. He was kind of doing films more not aimed at teenagers. Um, and this, just one of those films I just love. Cool. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think there's, there's an amazing moment when they drive the wrong way down a one-way street and yes. a lorry comes towards them. <laughs> and 
And Steve Martin just looks at John Candy. John Candy's dressed as the devil, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> laughing at I him. I love that and then, scene. And then, and then when the lorries have gone and they've ripped the sides off the cars, <laughs> off the car, and then Steve Martin's fingers are buried in the in the dashboard. He has yeah. to prise them out. I'm sort of doing it visually. It's it's, a bit, it's just hysterically <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, wonderful film. It, it was close to making my list somewhere, but didn't quite make it. Right. But it is a favourite of mine, and I had a bit of Steve Martin last week with The Man With Two Brains, which right. is peak era Martin. He <laughs> was a great talent on his day, no doubt about that. So we have another email. Thank you for getting in touch. It says, Hi, guys. Just wondering if you guys sit down and watch comedies together. What is the funniest <laughs> film you have seen together? That, Ooh, that's Meg. We actually not Thank seen that you, many Meg. films together, have we? No, no, um, um, maybe not a comedy yet. Uh, Possibly kind of not. Like what we've seen I mean, obviously, the silent film we saw the other week was sort oh, of yeah, a comedy. The, well, actually, um, the, 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 yeah. the Strong Man, which was... The, the I've not seen Lange, the Strong thought, Man. Oh, you not there? No, OK. okay. Mm. But, yeah, <laughs> the answer's no, we don't sit down and watch comedies together. <laughs> no, no, but, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we will one day. We will one For day. For sure, yeah, we'll put that Maybe right. Maybe by accident. Yeah, yeah, not on purpose, that be too forced but um so so was that your number, number nine, nine? okay i'll do my number nine which is dr strange love oh, or right. to give it its full title how i learned to stop worrying and love the bomb 1963 the kubrick cold war satire um peter sowers george c scott on terrifyingly comic form mm. and yeah it's just a standout film i think it's one of kubrick's best works overall Oh, I mean, I think it's one of the best films ever made. It didn't yeah. make my comedy list. No, but it, but it, which I can understand. It is, but... it is funny, but it's yeah. yeah. See, it might have been higher if it was more naturally funny. You know, it could have been even higher because mm. again, it's that distinction of it being a great film, but not yeah, necessarily. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I think I think it's a great film as well as being a great comedy. I mean, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's kind of it is funny, and if you look around, Peter Sellers doing all his stuff for the kind of arm and he's got a kind of fake arm that's out of control yeah. and um and you can actually see members of the cast laughing um yeah and we're rolling with the comedy list Ray's on number eight so my number eight is a, a charlie chaplin film uh but not the gold rush it's city lights which is okay my favorite chaplin film um i believe it was his own personal favorite as well um and i think people don't think of it as being one of his really funny ones because it is so moving. I mean, it's such mm. a sort of emotionally wrenching film. But um, but it has got some fantastic moments of comedy in it. It's got a, a brilliantly choreographed boxing match yeah. where he kind of ends up, you know, kind of punching the referee and kind of the, the other guy and the referee start fighting. And it's, and it's kind of... And it's all just done... It's kind of incredibly physical thing. And, I mean, there's an amazing bit where a guy's trying to commit suicide... By throwing himself into a river and he's kind of throwing a rope over himself and ends up kind of chaplain gets caught in the rope and ends up going in the river and yeah and it's just <laughs> a lot of stuff like that, that that's pretty good but it is slightly overshadowed by how moving the actual story is but it, i mean some i think you were saying i think you said about the gold rush didn't you that a lot of the best comedy is also quite sort of emotionally yeah involving and i mean um so yeah so number eight city lights yeah yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so my number eight is the first Billy Wilder film to appear in my list, and that is The Apartment from 1960. And I've said a lot on this film. I mean, it's probably one of my favourite films, full stop. Um, Jack Lemmon as C.C. Baxter, one of the great cinema underdogs, and one of the great satires, I think, on masculinity and a romantic comedy, but with a lot of human pathos and... One of the best last not lines ever in cinema, hmm. um, and obviously um, Shirley MacLaine is a delight as well. So, I mean, again, similar. I think it's it's a tremendous film, very rich, but again, maybe you don't always think of it as a natural comedy, although there's certainly plenty of funny moments in it. Yeah. But yeah, so that's the apartment number eight. Okay, so my number seven is Kind Hearts and Coronets, which is um, okay. British uh, uh, Ealing comedy. Um, and, I mean, this is a, a, kind of an odd film, but maybe not when you consider Ealing. I mean, it is, it is pitch black. It is 
Mm. It's it's about a, a serial. It's a it's a serial killer comedy. Um, a guy is disinherited. His mother is disinherited from a from from a lord sort of the Dasquin family. Mm. And uh, he realizes he's, he's uh, I can't remember how many it is, but about ninth in line to become an earl or become a lord. And so he sets about murdering the other eight members of the family okay. uh, who are all played by Alec Guinness. And um, just just very, very funny and inventive ways of murdering people. My favorite one <laughs> is he's talking. He's one of them's a photographer and he he takes the chemicals and turns them into a bomb. And he's talking to uh, the guy's wife and. It's all very polite and very sort of, you know, middle class and English and sort of period and everything. And in the background, you just see this little puff of smoke and it's hardly any noise. <laughs> and they just keep talking and having tea. And it's just it's just brilliantly kind of done. I just love this idea of people ignoring the kind of main event, if you know what I mean. That seems to be a very funny, yeah. funny kind of comic trope. A bit like Love and Death. Yeah. Great. And I think any list has to have an Ealing comedy. And it's funny you say that because my next pick is an Ealing comedy. And it's the classic The Lady Kills from 1955. Oh, that, is, yeah, that nearly made my list. Yeah, OK. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, a tremendous comedy cast. Peter Sellers, Alec Guinness, um, Herbert Lom, Danny Green, of course, the sweet old lady. <laughs> and I love the, the sort of gothic visuals of London and the fog, which is so effective and... Um, yeah, another one which stands up on repeat viewing. So that is The Lady Killers. And what is your number six? My number six, Back to the Future. OK. Which I'm sure, did that make your list? I can't remember. Have you mentioned that? Well, it didn't. It didn't. It sort of... Because I wasn't sure again about if it classes as a comedy. I mean, it, it's one that would probably make my sci-fi list, but I yeah, guess... Yeah, well, I think it would make that too. Yeah, <laughs> I do um, love it. I mean, it's it. just a wonderful film. I mean, I think what I love about it is that... There's very little um, waste in the film. It's like, you know, everything kind mm. of, everything, including, you know, the, the girl writes down her phone number for him at the beginning on a flyer, and that's how they know when the lightning's yeah. going to strike. And, you know, it's just nothing is kind of wasted in this film. It's just everything, it's very tight. And, yes. And, and that's very satisfying to watch, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. It'll get a mention in future weeks. So my number six, it's already been mentioned by Ray, it's Love and Death, the Woody Allen no. film. I think it's, yeah, one of his most vivid and one of his most experimental and consistently entertaining. I just think there's just so many jokes packed into each mm. scene and great chemistry between the two leads. Um, yeah, I think it's tremendous. Love and Death is... Officially better than Annie Number Hall. six. <laughs> yeah. By both of us. Yeah. I would go along with that. I would <laughs> so stick that my name to the mask. Yeah, but, so what's your number five? My number five is the Buster Keaton movie, and it's The General, um, which is just okay. wonderful. Um, it's, it's a, the General in, in the title is a train, a steam train, and it's during the Civil War. Buster yes. Keaton has to f rescue his sweetheart from who's been kidnapped by um, some, some Yankees, I think. Um, yes, and he and and much comedy ensues. Um, it actually includes the most expensive shot from the entire history of silent movies in it, where they where they where they wreck a train on a bridge, um, and they blew up a bridge and a train, and yeah. apparently into a river. And apparently, if you go to this river now, you can still find bits of the train. Apparently, um, you know, oh, almost a hundred years that's later. Interesting. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, but just very funny. Lots of visual. I mean, obviously, lots of visual gags. Um, yeah. And uh, just, I mean, you know, uh, Keaton would would always do these kind of perfectly timed, slightly dangerous kind of gags. And but there's lots of little gags in this as well. Like there's a bit where he's sitting on the, I don't know what they call, but those rails that go between the wheels of the train, yeah. and the train starts up, and he's kind of just sitting there going up and down, and completely oblivious. Um, you know that kind of thing. It's it's full of that sort of stuff. It's very charming. Great. Yeah. I mean, I loved it too. It <coughs> appeared early in my list, right. so I'll move on. Number five, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but Multi Python's Life of Brian. That's my number five. It's not controversial. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I didn't know if some people might have it higher. I mean, I'm sure they would, but Python at their very best, of course, caused an outrage at the time. And yeah, the weirdly ending. Though. Weirdly, of weirdly, course. Weirdly. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a film about no. Jesus. Well, it's clearly you know, it's, not. It's a film about religion, yeah. but. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. But there you go. Um, <laughs> and the ending is truly iconic. One of my yeah. favourite film endings ever. So that's Life of Brian. What's your number four? Well, my number four, I've cheated a bit. I've got, I've, I've done Laurel and Hardy, and I've picked four films. So I've done the Music Box, which is okay. the classic taking the piano up and down the stairs. Okay. Toad in a Hole, which is um, where they buy a boat and they, they're kind of. They're trying okay. to renovate a boat and it all goes horribly wrong. I mean, and the thing I love about this, there's just an amazing bit where Stan says, uh, we should buy a boat. And they're, they're, they've got fish, fishing, fishing lines. They're, they're selling fish. He says, Actually, I think he says, we should buy some fishing rods and then that way we can, we can catch the fish and we cut out the middleman and all the profits go to us. And, and Ollie says, say that again, Stanley. And he says, <laughs> we should buy a fish and then that way we can catch a line and we can give the profits to the middleman and it sort of just does this thing and then Stanley goes I know exactly what you mean <laughs> it's a great idea we're going to not buy fish we're going to buy a boat and then it goes horribly wrong and uh, they end up losing everything <laughs> excellent and oh so the big business was the other one where they're selling Christmas trees it's right. a silent one they're selling Christmas trees in July okay and one that I mentioned the other week which is Our Wife because uh, it has this incredibly funny sequence yeah. where they're trying to get into a very small car <laughs> the three of them and just it's it goes on for about three or four minutes and it's just crying with laughter funny um, and it just has to be seen that also is on YouTube I'm sure they're all on YouTube um, look it up on YouTube Al yeah Florida. good tips there great thank you so my number four is another well known one and that's Airplane from 1981 a pitch perfect send up of the 1970s disaster movies with outrageous and silly humour and Leslie Nielsen at his deadpan best and again that sort of idea of so many jokes packed into each scene just yeah. tremendous classic Airplane what's your pick? My number three is a Coen Brothers film uh, okay. but it's, it's not Big Lebowski it's Raising Arizona okay. which is an earlier one um just, I think Nicolas Cage at his absolute best. I mean, he can be annoying, but here I think he's, yeah. he's just perfect. He's kind of playing this kind of, you know, slightly vacant sort of... He's kind of mugging his way through the film, but it just works perfectly. Um, just some fantastic moments in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just there's a fantastically funny chase scene where everybody... where he's, he steals nappies for their child... Because uh, he's a robber, um, yeah, and 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 gets chased by everyone, including a pack of dogs, and it's going through a supermarket, through someone's house, through you know, through gardens. <laughs> it's just it goes yeah. on. It's really, really brilliant. Um, and there's okay. some great, great characters. There's a, his his work colleague who's always telling this truly gruesome story about a fatal car accident, but he's telling it like it's this kind of funny story like a funny anecdote about a guy who got beheaded in a car you know that he saw happen on the highway <laughs> so yeah that's a really interesting pick i did not expect that film to be so high on on oh your no list. I it's absolutely brilliant well okay that's because it divides people for coen brothers i think some people find it one of their least favorite coen films it's yeah. again it's borderline wacky zany humor and sometimes that can go a bit yeah, but yeah, I'm gonna rewatch it because it's been a while oh, since no, I've watched it. No, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, it is very funny. Yeah, great, great choice. So my number three, here we go. This is Spinal Tap, Yay! 1984. <laughs> so it got in there eventually. It got in there. Well, yeah, then, you know. yeah. I, I mean, love is... the stuff about the album cover, like the, the black <laughs> album. Yeah. To avoid Which is controversy, the kind of, the, yeah. The white album, isn't it? And, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know? and the backstage arguments. I yeah. love the scenes with their manager, and I'm sure you're going to mention more. That's my number. Well, yeah, three. I mean, there's the whole. Um, well, my number two is this is Spinal, Spinal Tap. Tap. <laughs> so, um, you know, so let's talk go. about it a bit more. I mean, it's just got some brilliant like, set pieces, like getting lost when they're on their way to the stage. They get, yeah. they get lost, and, and, you know, there's a bit where he's playing this very beautiful piece of music on a, on a piano and uh, and he said I'm, I'm influenced by Mozart and Bach and this is more like a, a Mark piece and it's, it's very beautiful <laughs> and he's, you know, what do you call it it's like lick my love pump you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean obviously the, the really classic one is the kind of this goes up to 11 the, 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 yes. the amp that goes up to 11 and the Stonehenge bit and but there's yeah. got so many little little bits that are really funny yeah. and and um you know, and, and I think it, it really rewards repeated viewing. You watch it three or four times, and you keep picking up on oh, all new stuff. And and the, and the yeah. bit that makes me laugh the most it's a it's like it's there. It's a cutaway 
they're interviewing the drummer and they sort of say, you know, do you, do you understand that all the drummers die in this band? And, and they just cut to a shot of him, like, playing and he stands on a piano stool and, and falls off. And it's just, it looks so real. It's really, and it just, it's very funny. Excellent. So, yes, so yeah, Final classic. Tap is one of the best comedies ever. So my number two, it's another Billy Wilder film. I think people can guess which one. It's Some Like It Hot from 1959. Oh. Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis, of course. A um, couple of nightclub performers, musician, um, and they're, they're out of work when there's a, a police raid on their club and so they have to um, accept a gig dressed as females, part of a female band so they're on the train and they meet Marilyn Monroe and they both have a crush on her so hilarity is, is sues. Um and it's just this really ripe sort of humour, this really uh, metaphorical sort of <laughs> rich dialogue um, yeah just brilliant great chemistry between those two and I think Wilder gets something sort of wide eyed and innocent out of Monroe I think it's a really beautiful performance from her yeah. And, and again, he knows how to do final lines. I mean, the final line of the movie <laughs> is a classic, and the build-up to it, which makes it even more funny. Yeah, no, it is, a, it is a great film, isn't it? Yeah, um, it, tremendous. So I think we've reached your number one. My, my number one, I would say fairly predictably, is Life of Brian. Life of Brian. Which I just think is okay. just... I can't think of another film, even Spinal Tap and even, you know... Um, some like it hot, or you know, um, raising arms or anything. I cannot think of another film that is so hilarious. Like the twentieth time you're watching it, you're, you're still laughing, um, and it's just—it's yeah. like every scene is a classic. I mean, you, um, so you've got you know, like the th- the three wise men going to the wrong hut, and then kind of coming in and nicking the gifts back off the off, you know, Brian's mother. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if she's ever named, and. You know, the stoning scene and the kind of what the Romans ever done for us and the yeah. uh, shekel for an ex leper. It's just every scene is an absolute, absolute comedy. Um, and you've got these brilliant characters. And um, I mean, I just remember the first time I saw it and I didn't know, I, I didn't know about the, the song at the end while they're being crucified. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, I was, it just made me fall on the floor laughing. And it's, <laughs> it's just, and I just think it's so funny. I love, I love the kind of Sermon on the Mount. I mean, this is, I think, what Python do so beautifully is they'll sort of take serious subjects, like, you know, the philosophers playing football, and they'll just kind of put them in. And you've kind of got the Sermon on the Mount, this beautiful, profound, moving kind of speech. And then but they don't concentrate on that. They concentrate on the people at the back of the crowd who can't hear and are sort of saying, you know, speak up, you know. And, that sort of, <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and then they start fighting. And it's just brilliantly funny i mean just kind of it's it's comic perfection um and uh yeah i mean just i cannot think of another film that i've laughed so much at so many times not even spinal tap (laughs) (laughs) that's Ray's number one and timing is everything because we're we've got a little over a minute of the show left so no no you're fine you're fine it's good timing so my number one is all about eve 1950 the the betty davis and baxter film i've said a lot about it in the past um but as well as being one of the sharpest and richest scripts ever beautifully performed by a great cast um, and direction as well. I think it's just a crucial film because it is such a feminist film of that era and it sort of reminds you that we really need more feminist films coming from Hollywood nowadays. It's j- just such a vivid and sharp film. So that's all about Eve. So I think the fantastic. feminist angle has swung it in its favour. Oh, so that's my number one. So, yeah, thank you for doing this, Ray. This thank was you. a lot of fun. It was. And we're just about out of time. So next week I'm going to be starting sci-fi and there will be new reviews as well. Thank you for listening and have a good week. Goodbye. Good night. <laughs>